Hey everybody, it's Professor Diffley. This is Philosophy 255, Ethics in Social Work, Human Services. This is Chapter 10, Lecture Video 2. So, uh, in Lecture Video 1, we finished with this. Uh, I'm sorry, with uh, 1.17, uh, Termination of Services. Uh, so let's move on to competence. So this is in section 4.01. Uh, uh, what we're talking about here in competence uh, is uh, the social worker's abilities, right? Expertise. Um, and so remember, uh, we started off the course with talking about uh, uh, grounds for malpractice. One of the grounds for malpractice is practicing beyond the scope of your abilities or your expertise. Uh, and you see this here in 4.01 uh, uh, here, right? Uh, uh, just reading, these are the uh, codes, uh, the word for word. Uh, uh, social workers accept responsibility and employment only on the basis of existing competence or the intention to acquire the uh, necessary competence. Um, so here's the thing here with this one. Uh, really should go on the basis of existing competence. You can learn new things, um, and you can learn them on the uh, job and on the go. Um, I would just be, you know, what this is really about is uh, uh, not misrepresenting yourself, right? Uh, uh, that, you know, some things can be learned, um, but not always, right? And so you don't want to say you have these abilities, but you should base this on exi existing competence or something uh, you're very, very confident uh, you can learn, right? Um, and again, you should be uh, strived to, uh, for professional development, right? That's what it's talking about in B here. Um, uh, you know, uh, keep critically examined, keep current with emerging knowledge, right? You're going to have professional development. Uh, you got to stay up on the, uh, you know, the emerging trends, the emerging treatments, that sort of thing um yeah again you should uh professional literature like journals uh uh you know new texts that come out that sort of thing um and again participate in continuing ed uh for your uh jobs here um and again uh so we're, we're you know when we're talking about competence here uh it's about you know you're always going to be learning and uh ensuring uh you're competent in your job as you uh go on um now see this one deals with uh Base your practice on recognizable knowledge, including empirically based knowledge relevant to social work and social work ethics. Uh, what they're getting at in C here is that you have to use treatments that are proven. Now, there can be some experimental or emerging ones, um, but they need to have some basis, right? You can't just uh, uh, make stuff up on the fly. Remember we were talking about when we talked about... Uh, uh, relationships between uh, uh, you know therapists, social workers, and clients. There are some that uh, you know social workers and therapists that claim that uh, uh, sex with their clients is beneficial uh, to the client. Um, there's no all the evidence says the exact opposite, right? So that would not uh, go well with uh, what they're saying here in four point zero one C, right? So your uh, um, uh, treatments need to be based on. Uh, some standards um, and some um, uh, uh, knowledge, right? Empirically based knowledge. Uh, again, you can try new things, uh, but there has to be a basis for it. You can't just make it up as you go. So again, competence, um, you need to uh, take jobs that only you, you have expertise in. So you now that means, again, if you're trained in substance abuse counseling, you should pro probably should not be taking on people with um, uh, eating disorders or something like that, right? You have no training in that. Um, uh, again, uh, you need to be able to uh, skill uh, to help your clients there. Um, so a little bit more in the uh, section 4.0, uh, the four, uh, eh, in part four, eh, sorry, this is again talking about individual um, of requirements for social workers. So the first one is what we saw last time. You need to make sure you're competent. You're only practicing within your uh, scope of your expertise. Um, but this is about discrimination, right? Uh, this one's pretty clear. Uh, we've talked about discrimination before. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> so social workers should not practice, condone, facilitate, or collaborate with any form of discrimination, right? So that also means, uh, you know, again, not practice. Um, there's a couple parts here. So you shouldn't actively... Uh, discriminate. You shouldn't condone it. So what does it mean to condone discrimination? Well, here this can mean just uh, turning a blind eye is condoning it, right? You see someone discriminating uh, against the client or something like that, a group, and you do nothing. Uh, you're complicit in that, right? You have a chance to step in and say something uh, by condoning it. Uh, you're essentially saying it's okay for it to happen. To facilitate means to have, help it, right? Is, uh, is That's exactly what it means. Or collaborate. Um, so practice, condone, facilitate, or collaborate. Um, 
again, uh, uh, do not discriminate. And here are the uh, some of the uh, categories uh, that they use for a discrimination. You know, uh, race, ethnicity, national origin, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, marital status, political belief, religion, immigration status, or mental or physical ability, right? And I, th this captures most, but there could be others. Um, uh, it talks about race, but it could also be... Um, I would add in their socioeconomic status, right? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it does talk about religion. No, yeah, religion is in there. So just don't discriminate. Uh, that's a real easy one. Uh, but that is covered in 4.02. Uh, 4.03, private conduct. This is very important. We've touched on this before. Um, you are always on the job, so to speak, in the sense that what you do in your private life will reflect upon your job. Um, and, you know, I've talked about this in class before. Uh, you know, most uh, employment contracts have something they call a morality clause, right? Um, so what that means is that if you do things that uh, uh, reflect bad upon you and reflect bad upon the company, uh, say things uh, in public, you know, or, uh, then you can be terminated for your job. Uh, people always say, well, isn't that a violation of freedom of speech? No, it's not. It's not the government limiting your speech, which is what the First Amendment is about. Um, you know, it, your companies can uh, get rid of you. It's, it's part of the employment contract. You're accepting that, that there are limits on what you can and can't do um, for your job, right? If you don't want those limits, don't take that job. That's how this works. But yeah, your private conduct really does uh, have an impact. This is why you got to be really careful about what you do on social media um, and stuff like that, what you say. Um, and again, how does it interfere with your ability to fulfill your professional responsibilities? Well, say you work with a minority group, uh, uh, you know, pick any one, um, any group, uh, uh, you know, depending on where in the country you are, you could be African American, we could talk about African Americans, immigrants, uh, gay and lesbian groups, uh, transgender, anything you want. Um, if you come out and you're posting things on social media and people know of you saying, uh, of disparaging those groups, right? Of being racist, of being biased, of being discriminatory. Well, now you have to go help that group uh, and you're supposed to work with them. Uh, they find this out. That's going to hinder your ability and interfere with your ability to fulfill your duties, right? And your responsibilities to help them. It's going to create a barrier. Um, it could be even more. Uh, and the other private conduct is, you know, this is where we get into uh, things like those dual roles, right? Where you're getting in uh, into business relationships with clients or their families and things like that. Just remember what you do uh, outside of your job uh, can have an impact on your job, can get you fired, um, can get you sanctioned uh, and in trouble there. So uh, what you do in private does matter. Um, increasingly uh, in interview processes, uh, companies, agencies uh, want to see your social media and they could ask for it uh, and ask for the login because they want to see uh, what kind of person you are. What do you put out there? So remember, if you're putting it out there uh, online, you're putting it out in the public. It's not hidden. Uh, this is the public persona, the front you are uh, uh, front facing that you're giving to society uh, and everybody else and your company uh, can uh, focus on that. So let's look at another one here, 4.04. We're talking about dishonesty, fraud, and deception. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. Don't do it. Again, do not participate in, condone, or be associated with dishonesty, fraud, or deception. Um, so what is dishonesty? You know, it's obviously lying, lying to your clients, lying to uh, your agency. Uh, this would cover uh, things like uh, misdiagnosis, purpose, purposeful misdiagnosis, either under or the mercy diagnosis or, or saying something too much. Uh, fraud. Uh, fraud is where you're defrauding um, others of their money, right? So that's usually what it is. Uh, fraud is uh, essentially stealing, right? So one of the examples we've had is uh, um, that was in the book and it was in uh, uh, quizzes earlier in the uh, semester was uh, the example was you have a client, social worker has a client. I uh, you know the client is using, um, uh, is working off the books or something like that. Is it's getting money she shouldn't, uh, and it's coming from taxpayers, um, and using it in, in uh, the wrong purpose, right? Uh, not what it was intended for. That's fraud, right? Um, another would be, say, you have a uh, someone who's getting uh, food assistance money or something like that, and they use it to buy alcohol, and they shouldn't, right? Um, you know, it could seem harmless, right? It's just a, a drink or two to uh, seem normal and hang out with their friends. Um, but that's fraud, right? It's because uh, it, it's stealing money from everybody else. Uh, and so uh, no deception, no fraud, uh, no dishonesty. 
You cannot be a part of it. You can't condone it. If you see it, you have to say something. Um, and that's, you know, participating in it is actively being a part of it. Condoning it is, again, seeing it, not saying anything, and letting it go. That is a tacit approval, right? Um, you have to say something. Uh, uh, you cannot be involved in these sorts of things. So make sure you know that going ahead. Um, all right, let's move on. Misrepresentation. And so this goes, uh, you know, again, with a uh, 4.04, uh, this carries a little further. What is misrepresentation? Uh, well, this actually goes all the way back to confidence, uh, 4.01 here. Uh, you need to make, uh, you know, don't misrepresent yourself out in public uh, to your clients, to your agencies. I, you know, there is, um, you know, don't lie on your uh, resumes, your CVs. Uh, people do. Uh, they shouldn't. Um, and it often comes back to bite them. Uh, but, yeah, you need to make clear distinctions between, uh, let's just go through these. Um, statements made and actions engaged in as a private individual and a representative of the social work profession, right? Um, so again, if you're, you know, what you say in public, uh, like I said before, or private conduct, uh, if people, you know, uh, you work for a certain agency, what you do reflects upon them, right? And you can try to say, I'm saying this and doing this in my role as a private citizen, yet it will uh, still have an impact on the agency, so what you say, uh, you know, uh, can reflect on the company. It could say you're stating your personal opinion, but you might be wearing, uh, you know, your badge for work, and it could seem like you are representing your job there. Maybe you're not authorized to speak there, um, that sort of thing. Um, when you are speaking on behalf of uh, your organizations, uh, you need to actively represent the official and authorized positions, right? Uh, you can't just make stuff up. You know, they're usually spokespeople for this sort of thing and that. Um, and again, uh, the, the big part here is uh, C, uh, should ensure that their represent representations to clients, agencies, uh, and all that um, about your prof uh, qualifications, credentials, education um, are accurate, right? You can't just make stuff up. This, again, goes to competence, where you can't say you have uh, training and skill in something you've never done before, right? That uh, looks bad and gets you in... Uh, uh, malpractice, and you're not going to be helping anyone uh, when you do this. Um, and again, only claim professional uh, credentials that you actually possess, um, right? Um, so do not uh, uh, lie about this on your uh, CVs, your, um, uh, you know, uh, your resumes, or even when you're uh, trying to help a client. Don't say that you uh, can do something uh, like that, that it's going to look bad on you. It's also going to make you lose credibility. It's going to hurt your employment chances. And of course, this is all going to hurt uh, the client as well. So misrepresentation, you got to, um, can't say, you know, you can't say one form of misrepresentation too. You have to see is you can't tell clients that you're going to fix all their problems, that you can cure everything they have. That's impossible. You ever been to a doctor, they will never say 100% uh, sure on anything. Why? Because you never know, right? They could be 99.9% .9 sure, uh, but there's always a sliver that something can go wrong, something won't go the way it's supposed to. So you can't say that you have all the answers. That would be part of uh, a misrepresentation as well. Uh, moving on, um, so uh, dealing with solicitations. Uh, actually, we're going to start uh, the next uh, lecture video three here with solicitations. Uh, I, I, there's more that I want to say on this than we have uh, time for at the end of this video. Uh, uh, so we will pick up in lecture video three here with solicitations.